Well, a very good afternoon to you and welcome to the Farm Kenya Show. I'm Noaki Kumboy. And even as we have a general discourse across the country on matters finance bill 2024, right here at the Farm Kenya Show, we are sure to bring you the latest conversation and news from the world of uh, agriculture and agribusiness. And today we'll be focusing on matters horticulture. How you can effectively do horticulture in a manner that will be actually profitable but at the same time nutritious getting the maximum value from your production endeavors and instead of course we have the specialist himself michael jerry who's the ceo of green Pornic solutions limited michael welcome to the show good to see you again all right at the same time on our nutrition segment today we are having a very interesting um how can I put it? A uh, food preparation, if I may call it. And uh, of course, we have Chef Ron Kamau with us on the show. Ron, good to see you. Looking sharp as always. Talk to me. What should we be expecting to make today? Today, we'll be making, uh, we, it's called Yan Thais. And it's going to be accompanied with some sweet potato fries. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is more like an Asian inspired kind of dish. Mm. Uh, you'll once we get to make it you'll see what the asian inspiration comes from and the components it's all it all has all right yeah. definitely thank you very much ron thank you uh we expected to see the yen thighs i know some of you are leaning a little bit west you're asking do we have the dollar thighs but today we are dealing with the yens here with that said let's start with the news shall we All right. Now, starting us off, matters nutrition. Nutrition is a key component of health and development that health experts equate actually to improvement uh, and improved infant childhood and maternal health among other benefits although progress has been made to reduce national stunting rates among children under five the gains are not equitably distributed across the country in the following report our health and science reporter gloria milimu tells us how kitui county is transforming its nutrition indicators through leveraging of different approaches like cash transfers Health experts argue that nutrition is an important determinant of population health, so much so that better nutrition is linked to improved infant, child and maternal health among other critical components of health and development. However, as nations of the world strive to firm up nutrition security in a bid to ensure that individuals and families have access to safe, nutritious, affordable and sufficient nutrition, this critical facet of health and development remains under threat. Counties like Kitui, that is home to over one million people, have felt firsthand the impact of malnutrition that has been exacerbated by climate change over the years. Elizabeth Musioka, a resident of Imale in Kitui County, is among those who have battled the uninvited guests in homes that seem so common here, malnutrition. <laughs> Just a few meters away from her home is Purity Anas. On the day we visited her home, we caught up with community health promoters who had come to check on the progress of one of her children who had been diagnosed with malnutrition a few months ago during a mass screening exercise in the area. At the facility level, cases of malnutrition had become way too common, as explained by Jacob Mwanzia, who is the nurse in charge of Kasala Health Center in Kitui South. By that time, 
cases went up to 84 cases of severe acute malnutrition. Kuna wale moderate, which was over 100. Similarly, the high numbers of children under five whose health remained at stake due to malnutrition were also being witnessed at the Musavani dispensary in Mwingi North, according to Simon Wendwa, who is in charge of the facility. We were receiving children under five who had malnutrition, whereby the MOAC was reading 11.5 centimeters and the, the height. So the things were not good at that time. Malnutrition in every form presents significant threats to human health. If left unaddressed, child health experts warn that its impact can be detrimental on the well-being of a child. To counter the effects of malnutrition in the county, the county government, in conjunction with different stakeholders, have been leveraging outreaches to reach the most affected communities with the aim of screening for malnutrition and initiation of treatment for those adversely distressed. Mimi kama community health promoter, niko na wengine, ambao watunaenda house to house, tukiwafundisha njinsi ya kula, ani nutrition, na pia njinsi ya kuzuia magonjo, sababu mtu akila According to the county, community health promoters who are deemed as the backbone of healthcare delivery in Kenya through the provision of basic healthcare education and services at the community level have helped turn around the county's nutrition indicators. Experts argue that social protection is an effective way to reduce poverty and vulnerability. Here in Kitui County, cash transfers are helping break these vicious cycles that more often than not have an impact on the general health and well-being of families. These cash transfers are meant to, to help the households be able to buy what they cannot be able to buy and basically also free them their, their, their incomes for other items. The money was meant for food and this food we had uh, we had partnered with the minister of health to ensure at least the families the vulnerable families know which food which kind of food and the food combinations are good for the for the health of their children and their households experts argue that this approach to improved child nutrition goes a long way in helping families meet their dietary needs as most children with malnutrition are often from families that face a range of economic and health challenges and the nutrition is a persistent global public health challenge to tackle the global burden of undernutrition, experts say nutrition-sensitive interventions coupled with cash transfers have a high potential to efficiently prevent malnutrition in all its forms. Gloria Milimu, KTN News. All right, and governors and leaders from the coastal counties of Mombasa, Kilifi, and Taitetaveta have rejected a meeting invited by President William Ruto to address issues surrounding the ban on Mogo car. The meeting was scheduled for Tuesday. As our reporter, Finit Oluwach, tells us, the leaders have requested for a later date to conclude consultations. The ban on entry, transportation, distribution, sale and use of Mogoka continue to be an emotive subject for the coastal counties of Mombasa, Kilifi and Taita Taveta in the counties that produce the stimulant led by Embo County. The ban that has been in effect for about a month now has developed to be a controversial and thorny subject sparking both political, economical and judicial war pitting the three coastal counties against the stimulant producing counties of Mount Kenya. Kwanza kabisa, tunajua mwoka siyo dawa ya kulevia. Ile ambaye inaharibu watoto wa Mombasa na coast ni kwamba wanakula mwoka na wanaongeza cocaine na heroin. Wakati mwoka imefika Mombasa Iko na mbei ya chini kuliko yale mandawa ambao munauzia vijana wenu. Diyo maana mbizigo yenu ya mandawa ya kurevia 
imeisha mbei imeisha soko the ban that has been in effect for about a month now has developed to be a controversial and thorny subject sparking both political economic and judicial war pitting the three coastal counties against the stimulant producing counties of mount kenya the ban saw protests from traders of the stimulant in mombasa and embu take to the streets to protest the directive the intricacy surrounding the ban and the backlash that came with it got the attention of the president prompting the head of state to invite leadership of the coastal counties and the mogoka producing counties to find a common ground and now it is clear that coastal counties leadership led by kilifi governor gideon mungaro are not relenting on the war on mogoka hili janga bado natukumba si janga la sisi magavana ni janga la uh, uma na tumesema kwamba viongozi wote lazima wahusike Issuing a statement in Mombasa, Kilifi County Governor Gideon Mungaro flanked by Mombasa Governor Abdul Swamad Nasir and several coastal leaders say they have turned down the presidential invitation for a meeting with the Mogoka producing county leaders that was scheduled to happen on Tuesday. Raisi atabidi kidogo atuie radhi kwamba eh, hatutaweza kukutana naye Jumaine hii lakini tutakutana naye baada ya mkutano wetu ambao utachukua utafanyika Ijumaa wiki ijayo hapa pwani wa viongozi wote wa pwani wa kisiasa na viongozi wengine wa takriban mbalimbali the ban continue to get support from all leadership levels with car elders echoing their solidarity with the directive manadamu gani ana aliyoruhusiwa kutafuna miti majani ya miti akitafuna majani ya miti tunamuita nini ana kichaa ana wazimu hasa kwa nini sisi tuletwe majani the elders were speaking in Kilifi County. Tumeleta mambo mengi ya kuyo dawa ya kulevya na hiyo migoka na hiyo pombe na changanya wa kila hawajui mwanadamu tena ni nini. Kazi ni kuua, kumaliza, hana ndugu, hana baba, hana mama, yote kwake yeye ni mnyama. Phoenix Oluoch Gate and News and to reiterate on the issue of mogoka ban the kaya council of elders in kilifi county have come out to voice their displeasure over the sale and consumption of the mogoka stimulant in the area the elders led by the secretary general of the malindi district cultural association joseph Mwaramfu, say the, that the addictive stimulant has negatively affected the mental health of consumers hence it should be banned across the country hapo pwani tuna tabu tayari ya madawa tuna tabu ya madawa kulevya ambayo ni munga unaletwa hapa tuna tuna shida ya bangi watoto wetu na sasa tunaletewa mgoka na miraa inakuwa ni kitu ambacho wanakuwa kwa kiingereza wanaitwa zombie hiyo imeleta mambo mengi ya hiyo madawa ya kulevya na hiyo migoka na hiyo pombe na changanya wa kila hawajui mwanadamu tena ni nini kazi ni kuua kumaliza hana ndugu hana baba hana mama yote kwake yeye ni mnyama ukifika Nairobi kuna sehemu za kuvuta sigara hata mimi nishawahi kushikwa na polisi wa Nairobi nikivuta sigara mahali hapa ruhusiwi kwa hivyo wana wakuja tafuna mgoka hapa watashikwa na askari wa kilifi we need to safeguard the health and the primary fabric of this community which is the family which is under threat right now by drugs which are affecting people of this community watu wa mlima Kenya hawawezi kuona huku yale madhara yaliyoko kuhusu watoto wetu ndio maana tunakataa hawajui wanajua mirai kiletwa ni pesa zina zinarudi lakini je pesa zile zikiwa zinarudi huku kwetu tutaenda si tuangalie nani atakuwa anaharibikiwa kisayansi pia imejitokeza kuna chembe chembe ambazo ukila, ukila zinaharibu uh, akili na hapo ndio madhara zaidi ya akili imeongezeka huku kwetu kilifi kwa sababu ya Away from Mogoka, let's talk agribusiness, where despite Kenyan women 
constituting 75% of the agricultural labor force, they, are, they face rather numerous economic challenges due to limited access to resources and inputs, social and cultural barriers, policy and institutional constraints and the impact of climate change. The prolonged drought from 2021 to 2023 severely damaged local livelihoods and assets, according to the National Disaster Management Authority, pushing millions into poverty as farm production declined. However, Caroline Gaia, a livestock farmer from Kitui, has turned challenges into opportunities. With the right breeds, she is making thousands from the sales of her livestock product. And our reporter, Levis Musimba, caught up with Caroline and filed the following story. In the heart of Malele village, Mutoma Ward, Kitui County, Caroline Ngaya embodies rural resilience and success in livestock rearing. Nilikuwa lafunga tu kuku tu yeyote, nikipata huko nanunua na weka, lakini wakati wa ikuwa inanisaidia. Lakini wakati maradi ulikuja na kunisomesha kwanza nikanjua kukipu rekon, nikanjua file na separate zile kukumbaya na zile zuri kama improved. Caroline embarked on her journey with the training from FAO officers, focusing on livestock breeding and management to mitigate the effects of climate change and food insecurity. Today, she manages a small ranch with 35 gala goats and a thriving poultry farm with 202 birds turning her farm into a sustainable and profitable venture. Kwa sasa niko na kuku miambili na mbili. Last one week, niliuza njoko kumi na tatu. Njoko moja ilikuwa inaingia 15. Nikapelekea mtoto shule, nikalipa. Dume tunachangua zile kubwa, kulingana na saizi hile inatakikana ya angala na, na zakike. Sile zinaza vizuri mapacha, juzi niliusa ndume, pili, nikapewa 42,000. The Women Economic Empowerment Through Climate Smart Agriculture Project, funded by the Korea International Cooperation Agency, COICA, through UN Women, has provided 40 women-led groups in Kitui County with access to climate smart agricultural technologies financial services, and leadership training. Tangu hii maradi wa WCSA, ulipo tusonesha, nimefaidika sana na chakula. Kama last season, nilitoa angunia 24, kuminatano za maingi, za ndengu tano, za kautis tatu, na rago mmoja. Caroline is among the empowered women transforming their livelihoods through this initiative. Kwa sasa, mama hako na pesa. Pesa yake, anjaanjiri wa eti ni mwalimu ama ni nani. Kwa hile mama alikuwa chini kama mimi. Aitanji mamba ya eti ni nitumie. Asumbuangi mzee, asumbuangi watoto. Ananjifanya na, ananjifanya na pesa yake. Phoebe Mutemi, CCM for Gender in Kitui County, emphasizes that climate smart policies are essential in creating an enabling environment for women in agriculture. Women in the communities have also been educated on policy making, implementation, leadership skills and so forth. Through dedication and the right support, women like Caroline are turning challenges into opportunities, driving economic empowerment in rural Kitui County. For KTN News, I'm Levis Musumba. Now on Marta's climate disaster preparedness, non-government organization has developed a geospatial method aimed at mitigating disaster before they cause harm. The organization says disasters such as flood and drought can be avoided if the method is utilized. The counties of Garissa and Wajia have already started receiving uh, this service as Hamza Yusuf reports. 
Engineer Simeon Biswa is inspecting a machine shortly before the launch of geospatial system in Garissa County. This is a huge success. Not only the county government, but also the county uh, people, right? They, how can people reach these resources through the, the dashboards? Can they query and get some data sets that they require? Can they download? Can they get a lot of insights uh, from these data sets as well? and so on and so forth. Through mapping and remotely accessing these areas, we can monitor floods, how, how water level has been changing with time, and also we can also monitor the areas which are lowlands, which are prone to flooding, and we can also advise the people not to live in those areas, and we advise them to move to higher grounds based on the maps which will be developed. So, According to CBU, this method will facilitate other essential services that provide services to Kenyans. Specific systems that we've, we've done include the revenue management system, the water management system, health facilities uh, management system. We've also supported Garita University, which is the only university in this uh, region to start up, you know, GIS courses on trail and resource management. <laughs> James Mukoba, the ICT manager in Garissa County, braced the geospatial system for giving them the ability to take precautions and receive timely report. Uh, at all the activities in Garissa were manual, but we realized that uh, the, where the world uh, is going, we need to automate much of our uh, activities, and that's where uh, we decided to work with the Massey Corps in ensuring that we have a system in place that will allow us to integrate all our systems in the county. As a CEC and in charge on issues of policy, I have been trying to bring on board the issues of policy in terms of maybe the ICT policy because that is very integral for us because we are developing a system and we need to have strategies in place to make sure that the system are up and running. While launching the project, the Deputy Governor of Garissa, Abdi Dakane, said Geospatial will create job opportunities and benefit future generations. And if we feed the right data, by a click of a button in my office, I can advise what is our road network, the, the amount of kilometers that are tarmacked, those that are marmed, where are they concentrated, are they concentrated within township, you know, what are the need, developmental needs, of Holoko, I can tell you. I can tell you what the development need of Liboy. I will be able to tell you what the development need in Danyere. In Wujir County, the organization Massicops launches a similar project that has already begun to be implemented. Hamza Yusuf, KT News, Northeastern. All right, that's our Agri-News segment. I'll bring you the latest news from the world of agriculture and the utilization of technology uh, to better uh, disaster prevention. And uh, that's a beautiful thing, especially with the extremities of weather. We have uh, floods. Uh, recently, we've had uh, one of the longest droughts uh, also in the country. And it's of quite concern, a huge concern that we should see ways to mitigate and technology is offering that buffer. But right now, I want us to take a segue into something different. Um, and this one touches on horticultural farming. Now, horticultural, I don't know, it's been a huge topic, especially, and a hot topic, uh, just to follow that hot with horticultural. But it's been that way, especially when you look at the exports in this country. It forms a major part of our export uh, bill. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing sector that we need to look at and how we can do it. And right now, joining me in studio to help us uh, understand matters of horticultural farming and how to do it right is Michael and Jerry, who is the CEO of Green Pornic Solutions uh, Solution Limited. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. Nice. All right. So, Mike, for starters, I, I think definitions are very important so that we understand. Sure. When you say horticulture, what is the scope? Where, where does horticulture start and where does it end? Uh, thank you for hosting me here again so that we can share the knowledge we have in the agribusiness. 
and also to ensure that uh, we sensitize our farmers on what to do in the light time. Uh, mainly, horticulture is uh, a growing of uh, crops uh, that are mainly used for food, like what we have on the table, mm -hmm. what you eat uh, on your table that is uh, like the vegetables, those, are, those food are horticulture. Uh, there are herbs, that is also horticulture. There are also some flowers that you use to, you know, decorate your house or your, your place that is also in horticulture. So mainly horticulture is growing of food that you use for eating, uh, for medicinal use, or also for decorator, decoration. Definitely. Yes. And even before we go to how to do horticulture right, yes. uh, paint a picture for us of how big horticulture is in Kenya and the role that the sector plays in our, our economy from your understanding. Uh, from my understanding, uh, I believe that uh, everybody uh, uh, contributes into horticulture because by the end of the day, you have to consume something. Uh, I would say it's, it's like 90% it's horticulture because uh, everybody, even uh, in the other businesses, they are looking on how they could be able to grow their own food, and that is also horticulture. So uh, it's a very important aspect to have on the table uh, of uh, growing your own food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And it's important, in fact, I have a friend whom I haven't spoken to in a long time, but he says that... Um, one of the critical skills that each and everyone has to have is the ability to feed themselves sure. and being able to plant your own food at least. Uh, because if, if everything were to go to reset, then it starts from there. Are you able to feed yourself? Uh, is, it, is it majorly practiced in, in, in large scale or, or do we have because I know majority of, of the food that we consume in, in the Kenyan household is from smallholder farmers. Is it the same with horticultural products or do we see what is the balance between the scale of production when it comes to horticulture from a macro perspective? Uh, horticulture there is a, a huge gap because what we produce is not actually sufficient to feed our people is produced in a small scale. And those who are doing in large scale, uh, they are few. You find that uh, whatever I've seen uh, in the story of uh, marine nutrition in uh, the Kitui County, I was wondering, uh, we have large tracts of land, but they are underutilized. Even with the drought and uh, all that, uh, there is a way that we can be able to maximize and reduce that marine nutrition to feed our people with what they need. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are actually for us, uh, for my institution that is Green Ponics, is what we are doing like here in Nairobi. We have been given uh, opportunity by the county in at Mamarusi Kibaki Hospital to produce for them food to support the nutrition department whereby all these children from the uh, urban dwellers, uh, urban slums, uh, the Mukuru, where, where they have the, they have limited access to uh, safe food, we can be able to grow for them. When they come there, they they can be able to get, and also uh, we can teach them on how to grow this food, even with the little space that maybe they have, because most of the people in the urban areas, like in the cities. We don't have lands to grow food, okay. but with the use of the technologies that we have adopted, mm -hmm. we are able to produce and fill this gap. But this is just the beginning. There are so many gaps that we have that need uh, partners and stakeholders to bring more ideas and uh, okay. implement these ideas. Definitely. Yeah. So partnerships um, are critical yes. uh, in pushing the sector forward. Uh, but also, I'm glad you're hinting uh, towards training, uh, empowering, and the issue of urbanization and how they meet at the axis. 
uh, even on the larger conversation of food security. Sure. So that is very, very critical. We want to take a short break, uh, Mike. Then when we come back, we take a look on how to do it right, uh, be it on a large scale or in an urban setup that you don't have much land and you are exploring maybe vertical agriculture, how to properly do horticulture uh, from a personal standpoint in a manner that is nutritious. At the same time, you can be able to scale if it is for business, all right? So remember, we have Michael and Jerry, who is the CEO of Green Ponic Solutions Limited. And um, we're talking matters horticulture farming in Kenya. How can you be able to do horticulture in a proper manner, in a way that is not only nutritious, but also makes sense when you look at the bottom line. Stay tuned on the Farm Kenya Show. We'll return with more. Right, welcome to the farm kenya show and uh it's a welcome back actually we're discussing matters to do with horticulture in the country we understand it's a sector that is significant especially when you talk about exports from kenya our exports are majorly uh agri driven uh and less of value added which is again another concern that we need to raise in terms of value addition in our systems but today we want to look at the foundational issue how to properly do horticulture in the country in a way that is nutritious at the same time it is profitable mike and jerry is the ceo of green Pornic solutions and uh, is here to talk to us about this particular issue so uh michael for starters now we've touch a little bit on the uh the bigger picture of the industry but when somebody wants to go into horticulture let's say they're green they're fresh from doing that thing now they want to venture into this world we call horticulture what are the key considerations that they need to have uh at least foundationally to lay that strong uh to cement that foundation so that their the, their their endeavor is not as shaky okay thank you uh starting with uh if you want to do a commercial production whereby it be an agribusiness now whereby you'll be able to make money out of the agriculture is that you need first to understand the market who is your buyer, the, the, your market, what do they need? Uh, if you find a market is buying this onion at 100 shillings per kilo, uh, you go to another buyer, you will advise maybe at uh, 150, you will do your variation. If you go to another type of onion, they tell you this onion goes for about uh, 50 shillings per kilo, uh, 15, 50 to 70. You will now weigh the two options, which one do I grow? Mm -hmm. Then the other thing you need to understand is, the, is your soil, the soil of where you want to venture into. Mm -hmm. If you want to do the soil based, uh, you need to do the survey of the soil. That is, you analyze whether it's suitable for, the, for what the market have dictated you to grow. You also need, uh, after you've done the survey on the soil... But on the soil bit even before you continue, first of all, I, I mean... The soil is the medium we grow our foods yeah, on. Yes. Um, unless you're doing the hydroponics, yeah, where you can prefer different medium. But majority yeah. Yeah. of our farmers use soil. Yeah. Now, we've spoken about if you're doing something commercially, vis-a-vis uh, -vis when you're doing it, let's say commercially, but small scale. Um, this issue of soil testing. Do a lot of farmers ignore it how how effective and how uh, critical is it for farmers to embrace a uh, regular soil test before they they go into into planting uh, most of the farmers are ignoring that aspect of doing the soil analysis basically because of uh, lack of the knowledge maybe 
and also the cost involved in doing the analysis could be. Uh, <coughs> it is very, very important because uh, if you want to grow this onion, there is a soil that is suitable for growing that type of onion. If you go to like uh, growing tomatoes, not all soil will do uh, well with the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You have to know to understand the soil so that you, you understand the requirement of this soil. The adjustment that you need to do before you venture into uh, putting the seed and all the other input. Mm. Once you understand that, uh, you'll be guided. If this land, for instance, you are racing, uh, if it have uh, the soil contamination that will prevent you from achieving the end goal, you need now to make sure that uh, you understand it. Uh, before even you come into an agreement that you, you want to acquire that, uh, that space. Okay. If, you, uh, for instance, the market, remember we start with the market, we, we start back one from the market. Okay. It have advised you to grow this type of a tomato. You go to land. If the, your land is uh, contaminated, you have to take the measures that you're supposed to take to cure that soil. Uh, then you can start off now the production. Because remember, if you skip all this process, mm -hmm. uh, you can just, uh, and you plant directly, uh, toward the end of the season, the crops are very funny. They will communicate after you have invested all your money. When it comes now to producing like a tomato, it will start showing the signs of uh, like bacteria wilt, fusarium wilt, mm -hmm. when it's now almost ripening. Yeah. Then you lose it in a uh, in a fortnight. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe the barriers to embracing soil testing is it something that is very expensive, or is it slightly inconveniencing that maybe farmers find it difficult? In, uh, why is it not a common practice? Uh, mainly, uh, it's because uh, <coughs> the cost. Uh, Sometimes the uh, farmers, uh, they assume this cost is very expensive, but uh, I would say that is ignorance because it will cost less than about 3,000 to do a soil analysis for an acre. Mm -hmm. But you want to invest 100,000 in that one acre, but you want to jump these 3,000. Uh -huh. It doesn't make any economical sense. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the... Uh, some some could be uh, ignorance and some uh, lack of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to do this soil analysis, how to do it, how to sample this soil, how to correct. Even those who know where to sample them, to take them, they don't know how to correct this and pack them. Because sometimes you, you might get a gadget to pack this soil. Mm -hmm. uh, before you take it to the lab, there, is, there are those uh, guidelines that you are supposed to to, to follow for you to have the correct sample mm -hmm. and have the accurate uh, results from the rub. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So you better count your cost and look at it as an investment yes. other than a, as a, an additional cost to it. Sure. Because you invest into the well being of the end product, uh, which is very important. Now, I, and I like your method because you're starting if. If you're a commercial farmer, you're starting all the way from the farm. Then you come, your land. After you've, you've established and you've picked your crop, uh, maybe I've decided from the market I'm going to do tomatoes. I come and I check my soil and it's suitable for tomatoes. Uh, what else? What next for me? Uh, the next thing that you need to, to have in place is water reliable source of water, and not just water. Uh, it is uncontaminated water. Remember there are some people who do this venture with uh, uh, liver water, which got a lot of, uh, you know, contamination, maybe coming from other places, uh, 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 lanes, they might correct some contaminant from uphill, then you come and pump this water into your field, then you contaminate your land. It's good now that uh, once you have these resources, like water, you have uh, like a tank and a system to make sure that you treat this water for, the, for you to be able to use this land for long. Because 
you know, even after uh, tre water treatment is key, mm -hmm. so that you reduce that aspect of uh, contamination that may lead to uh, useless land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Water. Uh, and water is life. In fact, yes. uh, we've, we recently had floods, um, of which uh, we were looking at, since we are a majorly, um, majority of our farmers utilize rain fed. Uh, I, I mean, rather rain water as a source of water for their, uh, their endeavors in farming. Uh, but the whole aspect of, of creating a system, you said you can put a small tank, have maybe an irrigation system if possible. Do you think, even in the, in the larger conversation about food security, if, if affordability, first of all, and empowering of farmers to be able to understand the criticalness of uh, water storage, and utilizing systems that are there like irrigation systems um, if if at all that is boosted and given a push do you think it will improve um, our standards and our approach and our levels when it comes to food security as a country yeah uh, for the adaptation of these methods uh, uh, it's not necessary that you need to have an irrigation or even those big tanks uh, the issue of affordability, uh, it depends with the size of the land. If you have large tract of land, you can even be able to harvest lane water and have like a water pan mm -hmm. whereby you store your water there. Then as you pump it to your farm, or mm -hmm. you, get it, uh, you get maybe the gravity to your farm, mm -hmm. you can be able to filter this water and remove all the unwanted, uh, uh, all, all the, un uh, the contaminants from this water and have it now safe for your production. Okay. So uh, the issue uh, here, again, it's now the skills on how you do it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just like you harvest lane water, you dig a, a water pan, then you just direct water there. Okay. There, is a, there are methods that like da having dam liner, having a to uh, something to cover this water to reduce the, on the evaporation rate. And that is something that can be adapted even in the arid areas whereby like right now where when we had the heavy lanes, they could have harvested in these water pumps. Then they have these uh, cover to cover uh, the power ponds. Then they can utilize this water later until uh, until the winter again okay it's like in the other uh, some countries they are able to sustain themselves with the lane water okay. because they are able to correct or harvest lane water and utilize store it for long and they are able now to farm throughout the year okay yeah so you have your water uh make sure it it is clean water yeah uh suitable for agriculture sure uh, you have your land soil tested. You've picked your crop. Yeah. Um, I mean, when it comes even to to planting itself, the quality of seed. And I've seen people insisting that get uh, authorized uh, seed. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes, like maize, traditionally, you know, our, our, our grandparents used to harvest and then leave a few for uh, planting next season. And now quality is very critical. Talk to me in the horticultural space. How critical are the seeds? How available are they in the market as we speak? Uh, <coughs> we go back to where we started, eh? mm -hmm. from the market. This market is the one to advise you on this seed. If you're going to uh, grow a big lock tomato, you, go to st you have to stick with that seed. Because if you produce another variety or another seed from another maybe company, then your are, you off-taker are here or your market is dictating for you to grow big lock. Remember now you will have queries with the market after production and you might lose your produce because choosing the correct seed is very critical. Mm -hmm. It's not just like uh, going to someone who have been planting uh, these tomatoes 
you buy, then you go and squeeze and, you know, do your canassery, then you replant. Uh, you have to ensure that you go to the, the, the light uh, seed producers or seed marketers and ensure that you get the correct seed as dictated by your market. Mm -hmm. And also you have to, normally, on the sachets of the uh, genuine seed, there is a code mm -hmm. that you have, you, you, you scratch, like the way we used to, do, to scratch the, the airtime. Airtime, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, they have the code that you, you send with your mobile, mm -hmm. then you, it can, uh, you are able to confirm that this seed is genuine and uh, it's safe for your production okay. because they have been charged by most of the farmers investing on uh, everything in production but they failed on the seed selection yes. whereby uh, they bought uh, seeds which were engineered in the laboratories or some people engineered some seed and packed them then they are in the market then you end up losing because remember here we are even as we are discussing what to grow, uh, the final say is with the buyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, market. The, the market. Okay. Yeah. The market determines that. So get the right seeds. Yes. Quality is important. Yes. Sometimes you can invest in all these things, but yes. your seed is wrong, which means project is dead on arrival. And you realize this after you uh, you have invested everything. Now, mm -hmm. now is your turn to get back money. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is when you realize, oh, I did, uh, I didn't select the correct, I didn't do the correct thing right from the beginning. Okay. Of which this is the information that mm -hmm. uh, most of the farmers lack. Okay. Because uh, an agronomist will come and uh, will advise you go and uh, plant this seed. And then yourself, you just go to the dealer, you get this, uh, I'll tell you I need a tomato. You go to uh, an agrovet or an uh, agro shop, you buy this uh, uh, tomato seed. You don't know the variety, you don't know whether it's an uh, improved variety, whether it is uh, a genuine seed. So uh, if you have this information, like when you are starting, it's good you understand everything f uh, for the seed because there are a lot of characteristics that you need to uh, to check on okay. for that seed okay and also the climatic condition you cannot just uh, grow the, this plant like a broccoli in arid areas it should not do well yes it, you cannot just go and do tomato in uh, in the hot uh, in the cold areas mm -hmm. you'll be fighting day and day and night with the bright definitely yeah yeah that's that's quite important and now in taking care of this crop um i'd like you to sort of summarize for us when it comes to uh, doing horticulture uh your your plants are growing um how do you ensure you have um regular water enough water so you're watering these plants how do you take care of those soft touches I, I know people talk about um, uh, fertilizer or organic fertilizer as an alternative. How do you take care of a plant till it matures to be the quality that we see here uh, on the table? Uh, normally, after you do the, the soil analysis, this soil, you'll be advised, you get the recommendation that your soil is rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all those elements. If, uh, and also you will also be advised on what quantity you should apply to, uh, to correct your soil okay. if you want to grow. Remember when you're doing this soil analysis, you have to fill a form that this is the soil, I want to grow this. If uh, it's for like tomatoes, uh, and now they understand this tomato you want to grow, mm -hmm. this soil recommendation, you will get to understand that uh, after planting, maybe after a month you need to adjust your soil or correct your soil with uh, maybe goat yard manure cow dog you know chicken manure mm -hmm. and quantities that you should apply per acre so after now you are you have corrected uh, you have these resources and normally i advocate for the long uh, lad use you use these uh, organic fertilizers okay. because excessive usage of uh, uh, these uh, other fertilizers 
they lead to you know the soil get tired they get too much acid acid or basic then you you have to keep on balancing here and there but the but the, these organic fertilizer mm -hmm. is even safe for your consumption if you're growing these produce so uh, it, the guideline here is that for a starters you need to have uh, someone to guide you okay. a, an agronomist so that you are adv uh, he will advise you on uh, each and every stage eh, what you are supposed to do and the application because that is what now will advise on the on the budget mm -hmm. of the input what is the requirement uh, each and every month you expect maybe to invest on something this amount of uh, fertilizer amount of uh, pesticide and fungicide and also uh, th these uh, these are the projected uh, output or the cash flow projection of this crop you will have okay yeah definitely so um, have a balance when yeah. when applying uh, your your organic fertilizers an alternative um, you said especially for horticulture you have to start with the market I have so many friends and I can remember specifically my friend um, the dad has a capsicum farm now the capsicums are maturing pretty quick and now he's just looking for market I, is that a common mistake that people do and how do you uh, counter that uh, to be able when you produce at least your your product is off taken that have been a major challenge with the most farmers because uh, they are not uh, properly advised by the market they just venture into they go and visit a friend uh, they see that this friend of mine is making a lot of money in this venture is doing uh, capsicum tomatoes mm -hmm. you go and jump and invest your money then after your produce is ready mm -hmm. that now you you are fetching for looking for market yeah. it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. because remember now right now if you are desperate looking for market then the, the middlemen will be learning to you because now they know they are, they're gonna make good money out of it mm -hmm. and that is what we are trying to discourage with the farmers grow what you you have a market yeah so uh, uh, this this issue of uh, growing produce and uh, you don't have uh, a sustainable market mm -hmm. it is a challenge that needs to be addressed by the uh, empowering or sharing this knowledge with our farmers okay if you, if you, even if you have the passion of growing a uh, certain crop for instance go to tea farmers they normally they are normally advised if you want to expand your your farm the tea farmers you have to seek uh, you know approval from the ktda if you want to mm -hmm. approve you have to also get approval when yes. when it comes to the produce who advise this farmer when what and what quantity yeah mm -hmm. so uh, the off taker is the main mainly is the is the is the key mm -hmm. to start this venture of horticulture definitely so so at least get the right advice yes. do not do not be hyped up to yeah. get into a particular venture you see everyone is making money in doing onions and then you jump into it then after you start looking for market uh do your research proper research yeah. and uh now uh, i i know at uh, green ponics you are big advocates yeah. uh in in matters to do with um uh, horticulture uh talk to me about uh, some of these services and how critical they are what what kind of advice do you do you give to the farmers what do you think is is the common challenge that a lot of farmers experience especially smallholder farmers uh, for the smallholder farmers uh, mainly the challenge they are we have experience with them mm -hmm. is that you want to produce tonnage uh, with a quarter an acre mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Then we recommend that if you have a small space, now we have these technologies that you can use to make sure that you are able to uh, to harvest to, to harvest or to maximize the output. Okay. Uh, for the small scale farmers, uh, now if for instance uh, we advise them according to uh, our farms where we are farming and we are making, uh, we have an agribusiness uh, center that this is what we are growing. We have a, a buyer who is buying this uh, capsicum okay. at 180 shilling. Okay. We'll give you the, the cash flows projection that we have uh, and this is from uh, our achievements. Okay. If we advise you to go and uh, like we, we, are, we are making uh, 100,000 per month with the capsicum, we are making these cherry tomatoes maybe 200,000 per, uh, per month. Okay. Uh, once we, you, uh, you look at the, 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 those figures, okay. they go crazy and they, li they are like, I want to achieve this right. in, in one night. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like some of them, once we plant, they think that the plant you will harvest tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They'll keep asking, uh, and this plant is not, uh, we are not able, we have not achieved what you said. Okay. So, so you have to invest, uh, to, time. To invest and uh -huh. be patient. Okay. Yes. Definitely. Patience is critical in that. Yes. And even as, as, as we do so, I, I think we want to take a short break uh, right here on the Farm Kenya show. But thank you very much, Michael. For your input, Michael and Jerry is the CEO of Green Ponic Solutions, and he says that a lot of you go for advice to him, and you want to harvest tomorrow and you plan today. Well, a little bit of patience, a little bit of learning here and there, that makes you a better farmer. But horticulture is diverse enough to accommodate a myriad of players, and I think that's a good thing. Now, we, after the break, uh, we will be cooking, and today we are doing the yen thing what do we call that the yen thighs that will be our focus after the break stay tuned this is the farm kenya show <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Farm Kenya Show. We are on that stretch, the final stretch that I like putting gloves on. And it's quite complicated. And of course, we have Chef Ron uh, with us. Today we are making yen thighs. And this is uh, quite interesting. Ron, you say that this one is inspired all the way from the east. Talk to me about this particular, uh, you know, uh, food that we are making today. So uh, basically, um, bas the main ingredients actually are Asian inspired. Has uh, teriyaki sauce, has furikake, and uh, yeah, teriyaki mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. So basically, a uh, number of the ingredients we're using are mainly like a common staple that we use within that are used within the Asian uh, kind of scene. Okay. So this is more or less like a Japanese, to be more specific, like a Japanese kind of inspired dish. Okay. Because the furikake is, uh, is an item that's just sprinkled on top of a number of dishes that they have there. Mm -hmm. Soy sauce or kikoman basically is something that's used to make broths mm -hmm. and their soups mm -hmm. and also as a dipping sauce okay. on its own. So mm -hmm. it's just a combination of all that to create just one particular dish okay. that we're currently making today. All right. Yeah. Uh, the, the Eastern cuisine talk about, uh, you say it has a lot of touch of Japanese. Uh, again, I'm fascinated by international cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the establishment where you work, Nairobi Street Kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, how on demand is the yen thai? Uh, it's it's a good po it's a popular item. This mm -hmm. is one of the items we sell at our concept. It's called Bad Exchange. Mm -hmm. So Bad Exchange basically purely deals with just chicken items. Uh, hence the name Bad Exchange. Ah, nice. Yeah. So it's more like a catchy kind <laughs> That's of. That's a nice. Thing. 
I yeah. like that. So <laughs> anything chicken, mm -hmm. bad exchange will definitely sort you out. Okay. With an array of, de of different items, from wings, okay. uh, with different flavorings, mm -hmm. to pies, to like a nicely breadcrumbed uh, chicken chicken breast. Mm -hmm. We call them dollar tenders. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is this is now one of those items that we, I, like I mentioned, uh, from one of the concepts that we have. Okay. So this is an item from Bad Exchange. All right. So, so what what are you doing right now? So I'm just turning the pies mm -hmm. to ensure even cooking mm -hmm. uh, on both ends. Doesn't yeah. like get too hard on one end. Okay. So right now I want to introduce now the teriyaki sauce. Teriyaki just, sauce. Yeah. Okay. So this will just it's basically just baste in it. Okay. Give it just the flavor. All right. Yeah, and so you can continue to cook properly and get the teriyaki flavor, like the, the sauce itself. Ah, uh, yeah. Teriyaki sauce uh, is it something that, I, uh, of course, in a supermarket you can always get these sauces. Yeah. Uh, is it something that you would advise people to explore, and does it go beyond chicken? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. you can. You can do. You can use it on a stir fry. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some veggies, if you're a meat person, you okay. can add it to your meat. Mm -hmm. Beef, chicken, pork, depends on what you like. Okay. Um, so it's it's not just specifically. Um, it's not specifically just to, with chicken, of yeah, course. chicken only. Definitely. So it's just something you can use on a diverse kind of situation. Okay. Yeah, it's just on this particular situation. Mm -hmm. We're using it in our chicken thighs. Yeah, and and you know we were laughing here even mm -hmm. before the show. Yeah, uh, one mm -hmm. of the ingredients that uh, we tried, I, I don't know whether it was last week or the, the week before. Uh huh. Uh, it was steak. Oh uh, yeah. And, yeah, and one mm -hmm. of our friends went and what? tried, and he bought steak, uh -huh. and he said that it became too hard. Uh huh. Uh, and too chewy. Uh huh. What mistakes do people make when they're trying to make steak, especially in the you, you said, was it medium rare? Like a medium, medium rare. Um, so with steak, you really have to be careful the kind of meat cut you're getting. Mm -hmm. um, really, you need, you're basically a butcher, you need to know your butcher, mm -hmm. how he cuts his meat. And mm -hmm. also the other thing is how you're cooking your meat. Okay. Right? If you overcook your proteins, it's going to end up denaturing okay. and it's going to be tough. It's going to be very fibrous. So you're going to end up with like a really, really tough steak. Mm -hmm. So um, one way to avoid it is just ensure you have a really good cut of meat. Okay. If you're not so sure about it, you can tenderize it, mm -hmm. and that will help soften your meat, the muscle fibers in the meat, and you can easily get what ex the, the the thing that you're expecting, like a really nice, soft, tender type of juicy uh, steak. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, with with the teriyaki on top. Uh, what look are you are you aiming at? Is there um, a particular goal that you aim to achieve uh, on that season? Um, just a nice golden color mm -hmm. and a well cooked chicken. Okay. Because you don't want to have raw chicken. Mm -hmm. So, because raw chicken, well, that's the only meat you can't. This is the one meat it you can't be really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food poisoning is. Mm -hmm. Can be can be quite a challenge definitely so yes definitely i see that so uh this is yen yes. yen thai yen uh, so again i mean this is uh, is it um uh, what part of the chicken again is it this the uh we're using chicken thighs chicken thighs. chicken thighs yes okay so uh, uh, if you use a different part do you just name it yen yeah. that part it's still okay because okay. uh, we just prefer using chicken thighs because it has a very, it's more flavorful, okay. it's rich in flavor, mm -hmm. and uh, it can really take on hit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't dry out easily as compared to chicken breast. Okay. So, yeah, basically that's why we prefer using the, the thighs because different cuts of, like the different parts of the chicken mm -hmm. cook differently depending on, I think, the, the positioning. Okay. Like the breast can easily dry out. Mm -hmm. So when you're cooking with the breast, you really have to be careful. Okay. So, because you don't want dry meat, this since it's it's a bit tougher, it's like the darker part of the chicken. Mm -hmm. It can easily take on hits. Okay. Uh, yeah, or very like vigorous, uh, like a heavy kind of exposure to cooking. Okay. So yeah, and uh, 
it's giving shikaki vibes you know yes mm -hmm. yes i see that so uh, that is uh, ready as it is or yes. are we adding another sauce to it no 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 that's okay. pretty much done okay I just want to put it somewhere on the side all right as i finish off now the sweet potato fries sweet potato fries yes potato is the world's favorite it's everyone's favorite. <laughs> I've I realized that. I, I believe mm -hmm. you have to be someone special not to like potatoes. Okay. But uh, no judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have our own preferences and all. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, I'll just let this sit here for a bit. Now finish it off here with now the final ingredients. So this is for Ikake. All right. Uh, the main ingredient here is nori. Nori is basically seaweed in Japanese. Okay. It's dried seaweed. Okay. Uh, has a really good umami flavor. Furikake. Yes, furikake. Basically means to sprinkle on top. Okay. So that's what I'm going to sprinkle on top once I'm finishing off this dish. Oh. Yes. It's that final, final, say, uh, final touch to it. Final it's touches. a seaweed. It's made with seaweed. It's made with seaweed. Yeah, like nori sheets is one of the actual ingredients. Okay. Yes. I see that. In terms of um, nutritional balance, mm -hmm. it, because we know chicken potting, mm -hmm. uh, these other elements that you add when you're preparing, is, mm -hmm. it, is it beyond flavor? Yes, uh, chicken thighs, they're really rich in uh, nutrients and vitamins. Mm -hmm. uh, furikake is really rich in uh, uh, iron, mm -hmm. calcium, so it's, it's good for your N vitamin B12, it's really good for you. Okay. And also, soy sauce is also a good substitute for salt. All right. And yeah, it's also rich in vitamin B12 and also antioxidants and an antimicrobial properties. Okay. okay. So yeah, it's a very wholesome dish. Okay. Uh, the sweet potatoes are rich in fiber, so it's good for your gut. All right. And yeah, it's a it's kind of it's wholesome for oh. you once you once we put in all these items together. So that's the plating. I see it's pepper plate. Is it uh, like uh, you know the world we live in? A renewable and uh, you know eco-friendly, eco friendly kind of situation. Uh -huh. Yes, that is something this that is, is you're very is, intentional. Yeah, this is also how we basically just serve also our, some of the dishes. How I present them is how you're going to expect to see once you come to NSK. Okay. To when you order any of our dishes uh -huh. from us, so we use this. Okay. And we just add okay. the sides there, finish mm -hmm. it off with some of the toppings that we have so mm -hmm. i just need my oil to get a bit hot okay and i just deep fry quickly ah. yeah because these ones were boiled uh you can either ah. yes they were boiled yes so you to boil them before you deep fry them yes it's it's a good way to avoid having too much fat inside your sweet potatoes oh really yeah so does it come off as um ha Anyway, we'll see the feel of it. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just boil them first mm -hmm. uh, to have them like pre-cooked. Okay. Then like finish them off on high heat. Give okay. them a nice crunchy texture on the outside. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can basically just enjoy this. Definitely. Yeah. The, the last time we were learning about mashed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I've realized potato takes so many formats. Yeah, uh, and it's so versatile, mm -hmm. you know. It's so versatile mm -hmm. uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. But that's quite interesting. You boil potatoes. Is is that a common practice, or is just that I'm used to uh, chips mui too? You know, you 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 make the pieces, mm -hmm. and that's it. I'm not, uh, I don't want to say used to chips mui too, but. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> It's just different preparation methods that we normally have. Okay. So this actually helps us. Uh, it's more like helping us execute dishes mm -hmm. quick, quite faster. Mm -hmm. Instead of starting from raw, okay. you pre-cook them, then you just finish them off on high heat. Oh, right. Just because uh, by the time you get nice golden texture on the outside, mm -hmm. so now the, the partial doneness that you need is already done. So it's soft on the inside and crunchy on the outside. Oh, yeah. I see that. Mm -hmm. So we're getting our, our oil heated up. Yes. I see that. That's that's quite interesting. But I, I, I like the packaging bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen that a, a lot of people, is that you measuring? Yeah, uh, I just need to see how hot the oil is. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. you see the, you've seen those memes, how, how men cook. And then they step back. Uh, <laughs> Especially yeah. with that much oil, man. Yeah, here you, you have you to have, be yeah, yeah, yeah. very confident. Uh -huh. we, we deal with this kind of 
things on a daily day-to-day -day basis All right. so you just have to be careful when handling such things definitely yeah don't go overboard mm -hmm. also be careful when you're handling anything hot or oil and stuff like that okay uh yeah more like safety precautions for your to so keep you from mm -hmm. getting burnt okay because you don't you really don't want to get burnt with hot oil All or right. not i see not that good, yeah i see that mm -hmm. uh-huh it's getting very warm. Uh, I hope it, it gets as, as, as hot as you'd want it to be. I like the way you're testing. Um, there just to, to have a feel of it. Yeah. Uh, that's the professional way or is that how we it's, everyone should be like, doing it? <laughs> some people use thermometers. Uh -huh. um, if you don't have a thermometer, it's just like a... You just use whatever it is. Either if you're using a butter, you just drop a small bunch of butter mm -hmm. and depending on how hot you want it then i think this is good enough okay yeah i see that so we are dr dropping um yeah sweet potatoes sweet potatoes uh many will refer to those as fries mm. and those fries do now they take different names yeah i see that uh-huh so the tanning so this is just to ensure like they're not uh they don't get stuck either at the bottom because i'm just using a pan okay uh and also just also kind of constantly just checking on how they look on the outside okay yeah they don't overcook oh yeah i see that so how do you know sort of they're cooked the color they get on the outside mm -hmm. and also by feel like has a really good if it gets a really good crunchy texture on the outside okay it's good on it's really you're almost there oh i mm. see that i see that that's very interesting way of making fries yeah like basically like mm -hmm. most of cooking is about fill as much as there are all these instruments that we use to measure mm -hmm. um one thing if you can't you can really go wrong with mm -hmm. is by texture like feeling some like by using your hands to fill something. Okay. So either the tough, the hardness okay. or the softness of a food. All right. Yeah. I see that. Um, I don't know how many minutes do we have because I know time is really running. Mm -hmm. uh, we could do uh, a little bit. I see some salt here. Yeah, just to season uh -huh. it. Season it up. Yeah. Uh, it has that gold, nice golden color. Mm hmm so see that. basically we just add mm -hmm. that to it okay so on our final add the teriyaki mayo teriyaki mayo yes so just mayonnaise with the same more or less like the same teriyaki sauce okay and we finish it off with some furukake yeah that's the topping you're talking yes. about yes that's, that's quite interesting yeah so Ah, that's it. I see that. So this, this one has it. to be imported. Yeah. No, 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 no. We actually make this. Ah. You can make. You can. You can buy it ready-made. Okay. But you can easily just make it as long as you have the ingredients. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of interesting. So, ideally, how would one, how would one eat, eat this, this dish? Just take a skewer. Mm -hmm. One skewer and enjoy. Uh huh. Yeah. I see that. So. You've had one. I could, I could have one here. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it's, it's a little bit calm. Uh huh. So this is uh, yen thai, thighs, um, chicken thighs, and um, with teriyaki sauce on top of it, um, infused, and it's been made the sh them shikaki way. Uh, let us give it a try. How is it? Mm -hmm. You can feel the sauce, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The teriyaki sauce itself, yeah? Mm -hmm. mm, so we just add it on the front to just finalize it, just give it that nice flavor okay. on the outside. And also the topping. The furikake. Comes, comes in. Amplifies mm -hmm. and gives you like a different texture. Gives you like a nice crunch because mm -hmm. that's how basically how we cook our furikake. Okay. So you get two different textures. It's soft and there's like crunch to it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, and the mayo bit of it. Um, I want to combine with the fries. Mm -hmm. um, let me see how that one goes. Soft. 
which is critical. Mm -hmm. I see them. Mm -hmm. Trying to. Um, do you have some feedback? Okay. No feedback at all. All right. Um, that's where we put a full stop in the interest of time, Chevron. Thank you very much. Today we've learned how to make some yen thighs. Yen thighs. All right. You're and uh, with that said, um, we always propose a toast uh, today. I give you that opportunity. What are we uh, toasting to? Toasting to? Mm -hmm. um, to making amazing food and to learning to make more amazing food. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much for joining with us. That's all uh, that we have for today's show. Thank you very much for joining with us over the past hour and a half. And um, I hope you've learned how to make yen thighs, which are really, really sweet. So at the same time, learned how to do uh, matters to do with horticulture. My name is Noah Kipkin Boy, and that's all that we had for you today. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Bye-bye.